Well, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Rob Cowell. I'm president of CFST. I'm also owner-operator of Chris Corn Associates. We're a food ingredient agency located in Mississauga, and we represent census inulin, uh, chicken root inulin, fructo-oligosaccharides, and also post-consumer brands, cereal ingredients. So, uh, so on behalf of CFST, I want to welcome you to our 2021 Table Talk webinar series, The Learning Trough, where we bring you regular webinars and explore the future of food. If you haven't already, please visit our website for a list of upcoming webinars, which will continue every second week uh, between September and November. If you are a member of CFST, all these webinars are free. I want to uh, really thank Dempsey Food for their generous sponsorship of our webinar series. Without them, this would not be possible. So today's topic is auditing food safety careers. Our, speaker, our speakers are Nicole Galache, founder and chief messenger, food grads, and Victor Mulio, founder, uh, technical director, risk optimization resource center. Uh, so before we begin, let's learn a little bit about them. So uh, let's start with you, Nicole. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So uh, as you mentioned, Nicole Galachi, I'm the founder of Food Grads. Um, about 10 years ago, I um, recruited for the food and beverage industry and um, started Food Grads um, five years ago after working in the industry and definitely seeing a gap. Uh, to be able to support um, students and grads starting their career in the sector. I'm um, a mum of two boys, uh, one that just flew the nest that is now currently a student at McMaster. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, thanks, Nicole, and thanks for being here. Uh, Victor, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Oh. Victor, we... Sorry. There we go. Yep. Go, gotcha. Good. I've been in the industry for about 35 years, uh, managing audit programs, was lead auditor for many of the GFSI, Global Food Safety Initiative Standards. And I'm also a, a, been a lead trainer the last 25 years uh, before I went as a, on my own independently and founded the Risk Optimization Resource Center. I was the food technical manager for SGS, which is the world's largest certification company. Hmm. Good, good. Okay, thank you. Good. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, so before we get into your presentations, uh, I'm going to ask each one of our speakers a few icebreaking uh, icebreaker questions. Um, and I guess we'll start with with you, Victor. Um, do you have a hobby or pastime you enjoy, uh, and what is it? Yeah, so, I'm a singer and guitarist. I've been doing that okay. since uh, I was in high school. That's um, great. Yeah. yeah, and it's been in, it's independent, been or do you, do you play in a band, or are you just I've your... played in multiple bands before but i'm i'm independent oh most of interesting the time. they do okay. recording actually my cousin was a bassist for alice cooper oh okay that's <laughs> really interesting there you go i'm sure that's some great yeah. stories there. yeah that's yeah. really interesting. good uh nicole how about you you want to share with us well, mine okay. mine's not nearly as exciting um <laughs> hobbies i would say uh my favorite hobby pastime is definitely yoga and uh, and reading um, and reading books about yoga and, and meditation and all that sort of thing. I definitely think through the uh, pandemic, it's helped me stay balanced and you know that then you know that that and red wine, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Less red about wine. balance. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's excellent. Great. Thank you both uh, for for starting that off. So before I turn it over to the panel, I want to mention that if you have any questions, uh, please write them in the question box. Uh, I will moderate any questions at the end of our speakers, uh, at the end of our speakers, and we'll attempt to, hopefully they can answer for you. As well, we have a, attached a PDF of the presentation in the handout section, and you're welcome to download that anytime. So without further ado, please welcome our speakers. Go ahead, take it away, Nicole, or... Thank Victor. you very much. Yep. So um, again, thank you so much for, for having me here today. And, uh, and Victor, we're, we're thrilled to be able to chat with you. Um, I'm going to sort of start things off with an intro into Food Grads um, and why I started the platform. As I mentioned, I definitely noticed a gap uh, in the industry for students and grads. Um, I think oftentimes colleges and universities would encourage uh, students and grads to connect with um, recruiters. 
And when they did connect with me, I'd be saying to them, well, you know, we don't really support new graduates exactly. We, we tend to support those that are further along in their career. And that's when employers will pay for, um, for a, a, a candidate. So there, was, there wasn't really anywhere to send them. And so I started Fugrads as a, a sort of a community um, where we would talk to each other, talk to industry members, um, gain advice and the platform itself offers the opportunity to look for jobs um, to create a profile so that you can share your resume and all that good stuff and essentially just um, be part of a community of food minded people and explore the different career paths. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. One of the things that was really important to me um, right from the inception was partnering with the right people. And I can certainly share that in the food and beverage industry, there are so many amazing people. One thing I, I did learn through my, um, my years of recruitment is once people were in the industry, rarely did they leave. Um, and mostly because of the people. It, it's, a, it's a nurturing group. And um, you know, whilst there are a ton of career opportunities, I don't think the industry itself has done a, a fantastic job of really showcasing those careers. So that's something that we, we look to do as well. And we couldn't do that um, without the support of, of industry. So these are some of the, um, the people that we work with. And um, you know, I'd like to highlight, so uh, careers in food are a, a large job board in ag careers. Um, through careers in food, you can access Feeding Your Future, which hosts webinars, job fairs, all sorts for uh, predominantly agriculture positions, but certainly food as well. And then more from, from, um, from the food grab perspective at this point in time, we are a program partner of Careers Now, which um, in a little while I'll, I'll share more about, but we do partner with colleges and universities, uh, with associations, um, Food Processing Skills Canada, they offer training, um, but we absolutely offer training ourselves through our uh, Food Grads Academy. So if you'd like to go to the next slide. Um, I should mention, we don't have to go back, but there's also, um, we tend to have our feet in, in, in two spots, food manufacturing and food service. Um, there's different pain points in both. Once people are in school, they tend to um, look at those food service jobs as an entry to either work the working world and certainly to the food industry. But they often don't stay because they're not aware of the career paths that are available on the food service side. Whereas it's slightly different on the food manufacturing side, the um, issue is talent attraction. But once people are in, retention tends to be a little bit easier um, because once they're in the organization, they can see where they can go in their career and um, the, different, uh, the different things that are available to them. So, um, so that's uh, one thing I was mentioning. That's why you saw Restaurants Canada on the previous slide. So one of the things we are really proud of are, um, is our content creation. Um, the, what you can see in front of you is our Careers in Food and Beverage ebook, which is a free download um, for people to explore 50 career paths. Um, our amazing uh, Veronica, uh, she's been with me really from day one. Um, she was a current student, it was interested in the Campus Ambassador program and became really quite instrumental in the growth of food grads um, because she's at Ryerson and she said th th there wasn't really any information uh, that she was receiving around um, the food industry in general so she always wanted to work in the food industry and um, and sort of work in the food science sector and um, she really didn't know where to look for things and so she with her with her student hat on was able to give that great perspective of where would I look what would I want at my fingertips and help me create that sort of content. So um, the ebook is amazing. It's an interactive book. There's videos, there's podcasts attached. And as I mentioned, 50 career paths that um, where you can learn about the, the opportunities. And we're building out that book. It's quite long. So we will be um, offering different versions and separating it out. So it, it almost in departments, that's the goal. Um, so that if you're interested in, depending on your education in a particular department, within the food and beverage industry, we can share the different career paths and, and break it down a little bit more for you. And um, I've mentioned the podcast here. Veronica is our podcast host, and she does a fantastic job um, hosting uh, right now monthly podcasts, but we're looking to, um, to increase that frequency to a weekly podcast 
uh, in the next little while. And she uh, interviews people across the industry and just, again, has her um, student or um, sort of post-secondary looking for career paths. So, you know, what will she do when she you know, graduates? What, she, what does she want to do for the rest of her life? She has that hat on. And whenever she's talking to, to somebody, um, she comes at the conversation from that perspective, which makes it unique because there isn't anything like that specifically for food and beverage out there. So we're really proud of the, the podcast. Um, so please feel free to, to go to foodgrads.com and take a look at the episodes there. Um, if you'd like to go to the next slide. I mentioned careers now, and this is Food and Beverage Ontario's um, workforce development initiative. And um, it's basically um, the, the, the onus of, uh, of, of food grads on us is to provide 12 mentorship sessions as well as 12 job fairs. And um, I'll start with the mentorship sessions. They start uh, soon. Um, and what I will do is send, after the uh, presentation today, I'll send um, Heidi a flyer which details the dates and the mentorship sessions. And I know there's one coming up October uh, 14th, I think is the date, um, for food safety careers, if people on this, on this webinar today are particularly interested there. And we'll have three speakers that will just talk about their career path, um, their education, uh, what they currently do with their, um, in their position, and, um, and you know, career succession planning, you know, what they, what they are looking to do in their career. What, their, what the opportunities are. Maybe that's not what they plan to do for themselves, but they can certainly share what the career paths are available um, to them. And you can really sort of hear from them the perspective of the industry as well. So we're looking to not only inspire, but to give you actionable items that you can take away when you do start your job search. So they'll be coming up soon. And as I say, um, I will share the dates for all of those. And we just launched, um, the job seeker portal through Magnet. So I've added a link there and I know Heidi will be sharing this with everybody afterwards. So you'll be able to access that. It's all free, um, but be able to access job seeker portal. And from there, you'll see the mentorship sessions as well as the job fairs. I should also note there's um, some training available, some basic um, essential skills primer training. Um, so please take advantage of that. It's, it's definitely built to encourage you to explore careers, but also to give you those next few steps um, as you start your career. And if you'd like to go to the next slide. So why join Food Grads? Um, as I mentioned, um, it's an opportunity for you to get found in the industry, um, to educate yourself on the different positions that are available, um, talk to people within the industry. I've sort of just brushed on, on some of the things that we've done, but um, for example, someone recently um, that I've been, I, I've been working with landed their first position, and it was simply through joining Food Grads and our community. Um, she wrote some blogs that was her experience, uh, uh, you know, getting her education, but then also her experience um, job searching, and not all of it was positive at the beginning, at the beginning but it certainly was, uh, the, the blogs were so successful because people share in the good and the bad, and it wasn't a great job search, and it was by no means her fault. It was job searching through COVID, which you know did present a bunch of challenges. Um, and then through the community, I would ask through my LinkedIn network and, and broader networks um, through Food Grads, um, who might be open to having a conversation or providing some sort of uh, experimental learning opportunity for this individual. And, and long story short. Someone did see the post and did connect with her and she's now gainfully employed and absolutely loving her position. And actually this Friday, you'll see her most recent blog, um, which talks about, um, you know, her, her, her uh, path. And whilst you're there, there will, and this is a great segue into Victor's um, part, there's lots of blogs about the experience of working with food grads, but also um, embarking on the training that we offer through risk optimization uh, resource center. And um, it's from the horse's mouth. We, we ask them to write testimonials, do some videos and all that good stuff. Just because there's so much training available out there, how do you know which is the best, which one to go for, um, wh which one is really gonna secure you a position and be respected in the industry? And we're so proud of this training. Um, uh, but you know, that's something that you might pursue once you've decided 
that this is a career path for you. So, um, so all of this is available through foodgrads.com and you will be seeing this uh, presentation. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Victor that will share more information about the uh, position of a, a, a food, in food safety and a food, food auditor. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nicole. So let me give you a, a personal perspective on uh, a career in food safety auditing. I've been a food safety auditor and trainer and run food safety programs for the last 35 years. Uh, as I said, 25 of it are running uh, programs that, that qualified auditors and trained auditors. So what are some of the benefits that you can expect from a career in food safety auditing? Well, especially now in recent years, this has become a very high demand field. Because especially of recent events, there's been a lot of attrition in the, in the field. So a lot of auditors, um, you know, in, in a more advanced age group are starting to retire. So there's a high demand for new uh, personnel to fill the, the demand and the demand itself is increasing. So it's a good opportunity to build a long-term stable profession. Auditors are well paid. I mean, a, a good seasoned auditor will make easily what a middle to upper level manager would make in, in industry in general. One of the big opportunities uh, in auditing, in food safety auditing, is that you can flex your, uh, your career. So you, if you like to travel, you like to experience new cultures, you have an opportunity for paid global travel. So you can go around the world. I mean, I, I've written courses in Geneva, Switzerland. I've conducted courses and, and uh, audits um, in over 60 countries. So if you like that approach to your career, then you can choose that. Alternatively, if you prefer a more flexible, uh, balanced life, you know, balancing your, your family life, you have family obligations, you want to uh, work from home more virtually, you can do that as well. There's been a recent push because of, again, recent events that have uh, brought virtual audits to the front. So you can, if you like to work from home, you prefer to work from home, you can conduct virtual audits or virtual training from home. So there's a lot of flexibility and there's a lot of opportunity to build a long-term career in food safety auditing. Bottom line is you can make a gen genuine difference in the world. You can increase food safety in the world and you're one person, but if you do the job correctly, that can make a, a vast difference. You know, I've audited over almost 3000 companies in my career. And if you get to that position, you've actually put your stamp on 3000 companies. So you've got to look at what the impact a good auditor can have. So you can only have this kind of impact if you have the right trading, training to be a great auditor or trainer. You can also join the herd and just be a regular run-of-the-mill auditor and learn just you know traditional run-of-the-mill audits. Won't make you stand out, won't make you uh, your reputation, but it'll give you still a good living and it'll be a steady income. So you can, you can choose your own career. You can be a standout in the field or you can follow the herd. It's up to you. Either way, you can make a good career choice with food safety auditing. The next slide, please. So how do I get there? How do I stand out? Those are questions you should ask yourselves. Well, you have to have the right building blocks for a successful future and prepare yourself correctly for a, for a long-term career. There are many, many, literally thousands of food safety auditors out there. However, the problem is most of them are poor performers. And I've, I've run audit programs for a number of years, as I said, and qualified a lot of auditors. And this is something I see every day. The most frequent complaints that we get from clients are that auditors cannot effectively identify risks or evaluate controls. So they cannot see controls from the client standpoint, or they cannot competently explain to the clients why, why what they're doing is not up to snuff. What this does is it presents very low value to clients. 
So why is this happening? Well, the reason why this is happening is because training of auditors is outdated. And outdated training leads to poor performance in the field. Now, what, why, why is training outdated? Well, most current training is clause-based. So what they do is they take a particular standard and they say, well, these are the clauses of the standard. This is how you uh, write an audit plan. And they give you a basic knowledge of how to do stuff like that. Well, you can read clauses for any standard. That's not the, the key. The key to good auditing is to prepare for a live audit, to actually be good at what you do. So look for innovative training. Look for training that will give you uh, development in your soft skills. And we'll go into that in a, in a couple of slides. How you effectively plan an audit. Toolkits that will help you consistently build audits that are, that are risk focused and that can evaluate controls effectively and objectively. So these are techniques that you actually learn to become a good auditor as opposed to just learning you know, what a scheme clause says. So it's really important to, to change the, the, the focus from learning just the text or the, the theory behind it and actually looking for practical skills skills that will help you in the field and help you be a standout. The next slide, please. There's another aspect that a lot of potential food safety auditors don't think of, and that is, how do I choose the right employer? So a good employer will reward your passion. And you can be a passionate auditor, or you can be, you know, just fill your pocketbook if you want and just run, you know, follow the herd, as I said before. But a good employer will reward that passion and innovative thinking. So they actually practice what they preach in terms of continual improvement. They don't just talk about it. They actually do it, and they'll use your ideas. So don't just apply for jobs. Select your employers. And with the right training, you'll have the opportunity to do that more. The right employer can make your career a joy because they'll actually encourage you your ideas they'll actually encourage you to innovate they keep you stimulated so you can and they share your passion so they can reward it as well so it's it's very important to to look for some somewhere that you can actually enjoy going to work and not see it as a as a chore one of the best quotes i've ever heard is from steve jobs who basically turned apple into one of the biggest companies in the world, the most valuable companies in the world. And he said, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and then tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. So that's one of the keys to looking for the right employer that will give your career a good um, kickstart as well as good motivation in the future. So in order to do the, in order to select an employer you have to be valuable to them so you look for auditor training that will allow you to find the right employer and once you found them show them that you have the tools to be a smart person and being a smart person means that you can be immediately useful and innovative in your ideas as well as to contribute to what they need so it's it's very important to to present yourself to these people in a way that they can see what you, how you're different, how you stand out. The next slide, please. So what do you look for in great auditor training? So there are some key elements for truly effective auditor training that will allow you to um, build a, a successful career. So first of all, learn from people who've been there. You know, you don't learn how to fly a plane from a person uh, who's just read a book. You learn from an experienced pilot. You learn how to weather the storms, how to react to things that aren't usual. You know, you re react to unusual situations. And that can only be uh, brought home by somebody who's experienced. So practical techniques and tips from an experienced, successful auditor and trainer food safety is very, very key. Also, 
look for training that's independent of a standard. Don't look for training that's scheme based. So this is this is the scheme. We're going to train you how to be a, an auditor for this scheme. OK, that's great. That will limit you to that scheme. So it's very important to look for training that's independent of a standard that focuses on audit skills, not clauses. That will allow you to become a good, competent auditor that can adapt to any scheme or any standard. So you can actually take your skills and transfer them. And this is invaluable to employers, especially if you decide to become not a full-time auditor with one company, but you want to be a contract auditor, be available to multiple companies. The way you can, the way you uh, fill your uh, audit card is basically by being able to adapt to different standards or schemes and being able to meet the requirements for a bunch of different ones. Of course, you've got to, you've got to train, once you've got the basic skills, you've got to train on certain schemes to develop the credentials. But the key problem with auditors today is not the fact that they don't have scheme credentials. The fact is that they don't understand the techniques of auditing properly. As an auditor, you want to be able to be consistent in your approach. You want to have something that will enable you to, to evaluate where the risks are in a client, in, an, in a, any particular audit. So look for training that offers you toolkits or techniques that allow you to identify where the risks are so that you can plan an audit more effectively based on those risks. You can perform an audit more effectively and more competently, especially with time management and with you know giving you proper value uh, giving proper value to the client on the audit it allows you to to report the audit concisely and well and to be able to effectively close out the non-conformances or or defects that you find during the audit and most importantly focus the audit on risk because the risk is what will allow the company to protect their brand, to prevent recalls or minimize the risk of recalls, to open their markets up, to open their, their products up to new, new customers. So this is what you're doing as a food safety auditor is not just running, you know, running through the motions and saying, oh, here's my report, et cetera. You're building the capability of that company to expand and to grow and to sustain their market share. So it's very important that you understand the importance of what you're doing and to be able to train so that you do it effectively and you don't do a disservice to the clients. Excuse me. In order to audit properly, you have to have what's called soft skills. Now, what are soft skills? One of them is effective listening. Learn how to listen and translate what you hear into um, risk controls identifying risk, identifying where the controls should be. Also, being able to write concisely. You don't write essays and hope the truth is somewhere in there. You, you write very concisely so that the client can figure out exactly what they need to do to build their system to be more competent and to be more uh, risk controlled. By doing these things properly, by showing yourself to be diplomatic, unflappable, being fair and impartial, being very effective in communicating why your findings are what they are. You also achieve the auditee's management buy-in. What that means is if the senior management of the company you're auditing doesn't believe what you're saying, they're not gonna change. So if you can transfer or communicate your findings effectively, that will increase the buy-in and that will help the client. In turn, that will build your experience and your reputation as a competent auditor. So these techniques are extremely important in terms of, in terms of building a long-term career. Because a long-term career, and I can tell you this from, from selecting auditors over 25 years, auditors develop a reputation in the industry. And if you don't have the a good reputation, it can work against you. Instead of building your career, it can actually limit your career by limiting the amount of jobs you're, you're selected for. In order to bring training to life as well, you need to have real life scenario 
workshops, not just theory. You need to have training from somebody who's been there in real life examples to bring these audit concepts to life. So they, they can actually provide anecdotes, real life situations, anomalies, things that haven't gone exactly according to plan and how you would respond to those situations. Those kinds of aspects are what build a great auditing uh, auditor training program because they prepare you not only for the usual stuff, but also for the unusual, for the unplanned, for the, for the things that could go wrong. So this is what you look for in truly effective auditor training, and that will help you build a long-term career and a good reputation in the industry. Next slide, please. So what can food grads and uh, the Risk Optimization Resource Center, or RORC, offer? This is one option. Obviously, you can look for any option that will give you the same kinds of uh, benefits in terms of training. You look for innovative learner-based training. What does learner-based mean? Well, people don't learn from manuals. People learn by listening to somebody who's been there and who can bring that experience to life. So don't look for training that has these two inch thick manuals that you will never open after you finish the training course. Look for people who will give you training that's suited to your learning pattern. So what we mean by learner-based training is auditors have different learning styles. So if you wanna train a, base, a basic auditor, you would train more on the, the basic tools, audit soft skills, uh, planning an audit, writing an audit plan, writing an audit report. If you want to train a level two auditor, you then will have more advanced workshops. You'll start to get more of the, what can go wrong? What do we do in this case? What do we do when this variable hits? So that's, that's what learner-based training means. The other aspect of learner-based training is to learn in a way that will mean something to you. So instead of saying, okay, here's page 13 of the manual, you say, okay, when you're in an audit, when you sit down at the audit table with your client, this is how you start. This is how you will actually ask questions. These are the types of observations that you would make. These are the types of documents that you would check. And this is how you would check them. So this will actually give you a much more practical approach to, to doing the actual audit. And so when you actually hit the ground uh, and go to a live audits, you will be successful almost immediately. It takes some experience, obviously, to get over some of the, the, the nervousness and the bumps. But preparation is very important in, in helping you through that. The auditor toolkits and workshops are another aspect that will help you ongoing. So if you have a toolkit that shows you how to build an audit plan, a toolkit it shows you how to build a risk profile on a client, a toolkit that shows you how, to, how root cause should be done on corrective actions. Those kinds of things will really help you build a good solid audit. The program that we offer in the ROC and through food grads is called Fast Track Risk Optimization Auditor Training. And there's a level one, which is an overview of the concepts and gives you a basic understanding of the concepts. And then level two, which, which is solely workshop uh, that takes additional workshops uh, to a different level. With either one of these levels, you get an auditor certificate, auditor training certificate, and that's listed on a database that can be accessed by global employers. The trainers, each one has over 20 years of practical global audit and training experience. So you get real anecdotes, you get real life experience as opposed to you know, somebody's reading from a trainer manual. Risk-based audit planning. This is extremely important nowadays. People just don't wanna be audited to a checklist. They wanna be audited to where their risks really are. So you have to be able to find those risks very quickly and be able to identify those even before you start the audit. Then they'll look at your performance. So how you perform the audit, how you manage your time, that's very important. How you ask the questions in a way that the answers become more revealing. How you ask, ask the questions to lower the walls, that becomes very important. Reporting of an audit, writing concisely, being to the point, and providing the right evidence 
for findings, as well as the right evidence that you would need to close any non-conformance or findings of the audit. Look for electronic toolkits that you can use as not only in your uh, your planning of audits, but also to show prospective employers what you can do. So these toolkits and templates, as well as the workshop experience, will build your true auditor skills, and it will present them to employers once they once they've identified you as a potential candidate. What we base this training on is what we call the five pillars of risk optimization, which would be advanced hazard analysis and risk assessment, advanced supply chain monitoring and risk assessment and risk controls, advanced corrective action and root cause analysis, intensive auditor training, planning performance, closure. And then finally, management roles, reviews, system updating and continual improvement. So those are the keys to any food safety system, and those are the keys to auditing effectively as well. Now in our training, we don't just say, okay, you attend our training course, you get a certificate, goodbye. We also offer you ongoing support. There are free e-guides, which are 15 to 30 minute um, audiovisual overviews of the key concepts and reinforce the concepts whenever you need to reinforce them. And those are available to you um, through a website that you can access at your disposal and at your convenience. We also offer webinars, regular webinars, quarterly at minimum, for registered trainees that deep dive into certain concepts and give you additional reinforcement of concepts and allows you to also ask follow-up questions based on audit experience or based on um, stuff that you've digested and you've generated um, after the, the first training course. And finally, we give you what's called an auditor capability scorecard. So one of the things that we do is uh, we give you not only the skills to be a good auditor, but the toolkit to show people what you've learned, to show people what makes you stand out as an auditor to prospective employers. So the scorecard toolkit will actually demonstrate what you can do to employers. So you go into an employer and you say, well, here's my application. I'm out of school. I have a, a limited job experience. Hire me. Versus you go to an employer with a scorecard toolkit and you say, I picked a product from your website. Here's the framework using the toolkit that I can use to build a food safety system. This is how I would approach a food safety system for you. And that can that can help you as a consultant, help you as a as an internal auditor, and also it gives you a, an option to evaluate your skills as an external auditor. So then you can build your skills as an auditor as well um, for an audit company or certification body. So that scorecard is another element of what we offer that will take your candidacy to a different level. It'll put you in a different selection pile for employers. So all of these things are what I consider to be, from my personal opinion, the keys to building a good career, a long-term good reputation, and a long-term career that's rewarding and joyful in food safety auditing. Thank you very much. Nicole, do you want to take the, re the next slide? Yeah. So. Um... So yes, I just kind of included the contact details. Um, again, you'll be getting this um, deck sent to you. But if you want to go to the next one, it just kind of um, the next slide. I think that one. Yeah, this this gets kind of all encompassing um, of, of the um, ROC fast track training. It's offered uh, in food safety, cannabis safety, and animal feed. Um, and again, can be accessed via the Food Guides Academy. And on that note, I'd just like to stress um, Victor's point about, you know, if you're able to go into the interview situation uh, when you are doing your, your job search and, and going with these kind of tools um, in, in, your, in your pocket, so to speak, then as a recruiter, you are in a different bracket. You, you absolutely are um, putting yourself head and shoulders above other you know, graduate students or, or job seekers um, that are applying to the same position. And, and as we know, there is competition out there. So if you can do any little thing to boost your candidacy, 
then um, you know it's it's worth it. So uh, yeah, that's, thank you, Victor. My pleasure. Well, th thank you both. That was uh, that was really interesting. Um, and you know, you both touched on what a rewarding uh, career uh, could be in the food and beverage industry. And there's so many different pathways to go. I wish this resource was available when I was graduating and looking for a job because I really sort of fell into a lot of what I was doing earlier on. So I think this is really informative to because people don't realize there's maybe uh, you know to get into food safety auditing, for example. They just don't they don't see that as a career path at the beginning or product development or you know transitioning to sales or marketing or purchasing. There's so many options available in this in this industry. And as you said, Victor, it's very rewarding. It's very long term. It's it's you know good pay. Typically you can earn a good living in it. So uh, that was really that was really excellent. So thank you. Thank you both for that. My pleasure. Uh, and uh, yes, you do have uh, the, the contact information on that. I'm sure you can reach out to Victor or Nicole if you have any more questions. Um, so thank you for that again. And uh, um, a reminder, oh, sorry, we've got to get into some questions. We do have uh, two, three questions actually. So if you don't mind, um, we'll start with the first one here from Shanta Islam. Uh, she asks, students who are recently uh, graduates from food science for entry-level jobs, how can we represent ourselves in the job market? It's a great question. I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure Victor has uh, has a comment too, but um, just to, to piggyback on what I just mentioned, you know, it, it's, it's challenging when you're a new grad and you have the same resume, so to speak, as a lot of other individuals. Um, sometimes the school you went to might get you that step in, you know, that foot in the door. If the hiring manager happens to be a Guelph grad, then, you know, there might be a little bit of a, a, a preference for someone. So there's little things that can happen that are out of your control. Um, that might get you in, in the door, but ultimately um, use this platform, uh, use food grads to your advantage. You can do some blogs, you can talk about the things you're interested in. If you're in an interview situation and not, you know, half the time you'll be talking to the uh, hiring manager and you know, you're, you're trying to appeal to them. So you're going to um, be agreeable, but if you can say, you know, I can prove that I'm interested in this, take a look at some of the published work I have through food grads and some of the projects I've worked on with, with food grads or the training that I've, I've received um, and, and put myself in a better position to hit the floor running with your organization. I mean, I, as, as a recruiter, you will definitely go to the top of the pile um, you know, of resumes. And I hate to describe you as a pile of resumes, but that's the reality, <laughs> certainly when you're, you're starting out. Uh, Nicole, what do you think of, of, of you know, using like up, making sure you know, recent grad has an updated LinkedIn profile. I find a lot of students don't do that. Is oh that, yes. Yeah. L LinkedIn is mm -hmm. it has become the place again as a recruiter prior to food grads. I was on that every day. Um, that's where I look mm -hmm. for candidates. It's so easy and accessible, um, and it's free for the most part unless you decide to um, to, to to buy certain products. But mm -hmm. I would absolutely make sure you have a profile there. It makes you look professional, engaged with the work, the professional world. I mean, I you know to continue from that. Sure, have your Instagram, have your Twitter, have whatever social platform you enjoy being on. Just make sure if you're in the job seeking mode, those are cleaned up. Um, yes. Yeah. You know, I, I I did. I was involved in a placement recently, and um, they do do social media um, scrubs, so to speak. You know, they will look at your social media, your your, your public face in social media accounts. Um, as part of the interview and hiring process. So um, there are so many different things you, you should be aware of around that with social media. Also your email address, all those things, you know, make sure they're professional and so that if you are, you know, corresponding with an organization, mm -hmm. you know, your email address is professional, uh, that type of thing. Good, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I have um, another comment. Yeah, that. yeah sure. One Richard. of the things that you should do on LinkedIn as well, consider doing a, a self-promotion video. You know, uh, instead of just saying, oh, here's my resume. Well, nobody's going to dig up your resume and look at it if you're a new grad. So if you say to them, you know, this is part of our, our toolkit training is, is show them how what you do. You know, this mm. is how you would you would present yourself. And if you say that live, a picture and a video is worth a million words. You know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, a video is worth a million. So you, 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 you do that and you you 
you know, you immediately bait them. So look at, we give you little hooks to get people interested. Do you want to save time? Do you want to save money in your food safety career, in your food safety program? You know, here's how I can help you do it. I have these tools at my disposal. Those are the kinds of, you know, it's, it's, it's selling yourself. So be, be yeah. innovative and be creative in, in selling yourself. Yeah, that's excellent, excellent advice. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Victor, here's a question for you. Uh, what tools do you use? Uh, this is from, sorry, this is from Ron Wasik. Wasik. What tools do you use for remote auditing? Well, yeah. remote auditing is a, is is a, a, a unique animal in that in that you know most people think that they're just going to transfer a regular audit and do it remotely. It doesn't work that way. You need to be much more time managed. You must. You need to be much more focused. For instance, you have to do a lot more pre preparation work. So in our in our template in our training, we have a specific training for remote audits and part of the uh, as part of the auditor training module. So what we, uh, an example of that is you have to know camera position at each given time. So what does the camera do? So what we, when the camera enters an area, you look up, down, left, right you pan at a certain speed, you train people on how to do it. So you have a pre-audit meeting to set this stuff up. Then you find out, you know, what are the, the documents? How are, they, how are the documents set up? Are they electronic? Are they hard copy? You know, and then based on that, you would then determine how you would, you would present them during an, a virtual audit. So for instance, if they're electronic, all you have to do is give them control and let them share their screen. But if they're hard copy, you have to set up a camera in a certain location and actually move documents in and out of the field of view. So it's a very, very uh, specific type of skill that you, you train for virtual auditing. And also you, you have to manage your time very, very critically. So what you do is we, we teach concepts called audit trails where we actually will allow you to focus, build a chain uh, of an audit rather than randomly packet stuff so that you don't have the, the client running around. So it's really important to have the client well man managing their time as well as yours. And that will um, transfer to the client, communicate to the client how competent you are. Okay, excellent. Yeah, good. Uh, another question for Victor. In, in your opinion, who, whoops, let me see that just jumped on me. Sorry about that. Uh, in your opinion, who makes the best auditor, someone fresh out of university or someone with some years of manufacturing experience is a good one <laughs> uh, if you want if you it, manufacturing experience is okay yeah it, it's all about skill set it's all about personality if if you and this is a problem that a lot of people do have they they hire auditors based on credentials or experience rather than on the skills so what i do when i'm looking for an auditor is i look for the personality I look for the person who's got open-minded, uh, you know, and that's why kind of Nicole and I have both kind of focused on training a next level of next generation of professionals because there's less unlearning to do. You know, the people who've been taught the wrong way of how to audit, who've been taught to audit in a very, you know, dictatorial manner or very checklist-based manner, they're not as open-minded so, and clients can see that right away. They may have to you know, they may have to swallow it, they may have to accept it because there's no other choice, but they won't be happy about it. So the, the key here is to, is to hire a person based on personality. And the more open you are to new concepts, to new ways of doing things, the more you can communicate that to the client and the more uh, able you are to understand how a client is controlling risks, how the client approach is working or is not working and you can explain to them in their understanding from their standpoint how the uh, you can empathize you can put yourself in their shoes and you can uh, you can uh, give them the priority on that basis so for instance an example of that would be yes i understand that you you have limited resources you're very strapped on time so this is why you need to to, to prioritize your tasks. You prioritize your tasks based on risk so that you can manage your time better and reduce your risk while not spending a fortune on, on spinning your wheels when it's not necessary. You know, those kinds of techniques. So that's why an auditor who's more receptive to new ideas, more open-minded, but also is unflappable, uh, firm, calm in their demeanor, very friend, you know, out, you know, friendly, although that can be developed with auditor soft skills training. 
those are the aspects we look for in a good auditor not not you know necessarily manufacturing experience you can learn that good okay and uh heidi we still have time for more questions we good yeah just checking it yeah we could do a few more okay good uh great lots of questions coming in here okay uh, Victor, here's another one for you. The um, uh, question is, and thanks for your presentation, it says, after your audit training, auditing training, does a new grad need industry experience before getting hired as an auditor, <clears throat> or can they get hired immediately after your training without industry experience? Kind of a tag on to what you just uh, talked about. Yeah, it's, it's some... more about, again, if you, can, if you can tell a company that you have the toolkits to audit, independently of the standard because companies have different standards so they you know they, uh, I, I hate to throw out acronyms but they're you know british retail consortium audit safe quality food audit food safety system certification audits there are different schemes out there so if you can show people that you have the skills to adapt to any one of these schemes very quickly and you have the tools to do it you mm -hmm. can you can get uh, in the door now, are you going to be a lead auditor or are you going to be a, a certification body auditor right away? Maybe not. That might take some, some experience to be a lead. However, certification bodies right now are desperately looking for auditors. They are so desperate for auditors. They'll be more than happy to take you on as a team auditor. So you, you can then join and, and use your audit skills as a team member with a lead auditor and then depending on, you know, there are two types of audits. There are what they call accredited audits and unaccredited audits. So unaccredited food safety audits, they don't have specific training requirements or experience requirements for auditors. So a lot of certification bodies will put new auditors into the unaccredited audits, build their experience, and then move them into the accredited arena. And while you're auditing, while you're making money as an auditor, you're also building, training, taking the scheme training courses or whatever you need to do to get uh, those, those qualifications. And in this, remember that when it says food industry experience, audit experience counts. So it's not just, you, you, not just manufacturing experience. If you're a food safety auditor, it also counts as food industry experience. So that's an important un, a concept to understand. But it's really important, don't just go for lead auditors, don't just go for certification body. This is something that we train when you're talking about promoting yourself, is understand what, where you belong, where you can fit in right away, where you can accelerate your career, where you can kickstart it. And then you can, then we tell you the next steps to get into, because I used to qualify auditors all the time for these schemes. So this is one of the things that you have to learn is you have to take training from somebody who also knows what the qualification requirements are that can steer you mm -hmm. in the right direction. You know, so don't, you know, you don't expect to be a lead auditor right away, but you can expect to be hired uh, pretty quickly if you have the right tools. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see, do we have any more? Yeah, so here's another question from uh, Ron. Uh, hello, thank you for the interesting and important information. Can biotechnology students be useful in a food industry, not only in the lab? Hmm. Yes, Nicole, absolutely. That, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm I, I'm I'm a biochemist and a, and a microbiologist, so I was a I was I was a bench guy when I first came out of school, mm -hmm. and found out pretty quickly that I couldn't stand it, so moved into something more, uh, you know, more uh, adventurous, if you will, or more outgoing. Uh, so it's it's very important that it's not necessarily the the the, the training. It's more the skill set. It's more the understanding. So even if you're a, a bench lab tech or you're, you're a biotechnologist or, you know, different types of skills, you can be trained to be a good auditor. It's just a matter of, you know, where, where your audits fit in, because you can, for instance, be something like a food defense auditor, you know, a food security auditor. You, you can also have these niche type of audits where you don't necessarily have mm -hmm. food manufacturing background. So there are other aspects, but risk risk assessment, for instance, is a pretty universal concept once you get it. So you can you can use risk assessment, for instance, in building an, a, a plane as much as building a food safety system. You know, in yeah, fact, yeah. HACCP, the whole hazard analysis critical control point, came from engineering engineering failure mode analysis. So you know, it's 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 not anybody who can get into this field but it, they have to have the right tools. Right, okay.
Okay, good. And I should have audited that question better because that was from Irina Fadiva, not from Ron. So sorry about that, Irina. That was Irina's question. Great. I, uh, Heidi, I think, I think that's it. Is that, uh, I think that's it for questions. Um, so thank you again, everyone. That was, that was wonderful. Um, and the contact information is up on the screen again. I'm sure uh, Nicole and Victor, you're available at any time. Take uh, any more questions if, if anyone has it. And uh, so let's uh, uh, wrap, wrap this up. A uh, reminder that we're hosting these webinars every uh, second Wednesday from September to November. Our next webinar is Ask Me Anything with Dana McCauley. Dana is the Chief Experience Officer at Canadian Food Innovation Network, and that will be on Wednesday, September 22nd at the same time at noon. So registration is now open on our website. So please submit your questions to Dana through the registration platform. It's free for all CFST members. Um, and so thank you again to both speakers. We really appreciated that. And uh, thank you to all for attending and please all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Thanks, Dale.